The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment by Eckhart Tolle. I hope you enjoy. Introduction The Origin of This Book I have little use for the past and rarely think about it. However, I would briefly like to tell you how I came to be a spiritual teacher and how this book came into existence. Until my 30th year, I lived in a state of almost continuous anxiety interspersed with periods of suicidal depression. It feels now as if I'm talking about some past lifetime or somebody else's life. One night, not long after my 29th birthday, I woke up in the early hours with a feeling of absolute dread. I had woken up with such a feeling many times before, but this time it was more intense than it had ever been. The silence of the night, the vague outlines of the furniture in the dark room, the distant noise of a passing train, everything felt so alien, so hostile, and so utterly meaningless that it created in me a deep loathing of the world. The most loathsome thing of all, however, was my own existence. What was the point in continuing to live with this burden of misery? Why carry on with this continuous struggle? I could feel that a deep longing for annihilation, for non-existence, was now becoming much stronger than the instinctive desire to continue to live. I cannot live with myself any longer. This was the thought that kept repeating itself in my mind. Then suddenly, I became aware of what a peculiar thought it was. Am I one or two? If I cannot live with myself, there must be two of me, the I and the self that I cannot live with. Maybe, I thought, one of them is not real. I was so stunned by this strange realization that my mind stopped. I was fully conscious, but there were no more thoughts. Then I felt drawn into what seemed like a vortex of energy. It was a slow movement at first, and then accelerated. I was gripped by an intense fear, and my body started to shake. I heard the words, resist nothing, as if spoken inside my chest. I could feel myself being sucked into a void. It felt as if the void was inside myself rather than outside. Suddenly, there was no more fear, and I let myself fall into that void. I have no recollection of what happened after that. I was awakened by the chirping of a bird outside the window. I had never heard such a sound before. My eyes were still closed, and I saw the image of a precious diamond. Yes, if a diamond could make a sound, this is what it would be like. I opened my eyes. The first light of dawn was filtering through the curtains. Without any thought, I felt, I knew that there is infinitely more to light than we realize. That soft luminosity filtering through the curtains was love itself. Tears came into my eyes. I got up and walked around the room. I recognized the room, and yet I knew that I had never truly seen it before. Everything was fresh and pristine, as if it had just come into existence. I picked up things, a pencil, an empty bottle, marveling at the beauty and aliveness of it all. That day, I walked around the city in utter amazement at the miracle of life on earth, as if I had just been born into this world. For the next five months, I lived in a state of uninterrupted deep peace and bliss. After that, it diminished somewhat in intensity. Or perhaps it just seemed to because it became my natural state. I could still function in the world, although I realized that nothing I ever did could possibly add anything to what I had already had. I knew, of course, that something profoundly significant had happened to me, but I didn't understand it at all. It wasn't until several years later after I had read spiritual texts and spent time with spiritual teachers 
that I realized that what everybody was looking for had already happened to me. I understood that the intense pressure of suffering that night must have forced my consciousness to withdraw from its identification with the unhappy and deeply fearful self, which is ultimately a fiction of the mind. This withdrawal must have been so complete that this false, suffering self immediately collapsed, just as if a plug had been pulled out of an inflatable toy. What was left then was my true nature as the ever-present I am, consciousness in its pure state prior to identification with the form. Later, I also learned to go into that inner timeless and deathless realm that I had originally perceived as a void and remain fully conscious. I dwelt in states of such indescribable bliss and sacredness that even the original experience I just described pales in comparison. A time came when, for a while, I was left with nothing on the physical plane. I had no relationships, no job, no home, no socially defined identity. I spent almost two years sitting on park benches in a state of the most intense joy. But even the most beautiful experiences come and go. More fundamental, perhaps, than any experience is the undercurrent of peace that has never left me since then. Sometimes it is very strong, almost palpable, and others can feel it too. At other times, it is somewhere in the background, like a distant melody. Later, people would occasionally come up to me and say, I want what you have. Can you give it to me? Or show me how to get it? And I would say, you have it already. You just can't feel it because your mind is making too much noise. That answer later grew into the book that you were holding in your hands. Before I knew it, I had an external identity again. I had become a spiritual teacher. The truth that is within you. This book represents the essence of my work, as far as it can be conveyed in words, with individuals in small groups of spiritual seekers during the past 10 years, in Europe and in North America. In deep love and appreciation, I would like to thank those exceptional people for their courage, their willingness to embrace inner change, their challenging questions, and their readiness to listen. This book would not have come into existence without them. They belong to what is as yet a small but fortunately growing minority of spiritual pioneers, people who are reaching a point where they become capable of breaking out of inherited collective mind patterns that have kept humans in bondage to suffering for eons. I trust that this book will find its way to those who are ready for such radical inner transformation and so act as a catalyst for it. I also hope that it will reach many others who will find its content worthy of consideration although they may not be ready to fully live or practice it. It is possible that at a later time, the seed that was sown when reading this book will merge with the seed of enlightenment that each human carries within. And suddenly, that seed will sprout and come alive within them. The book in its present form originated, often spontaneously, in response to questions asked by individuals in seminars, meditation classes, and private counseling sessions. And so, I have kept the question and answer format. I learned and received as much in those classes and sessions as the questioners. Some of the questions and answers I wrote down almost verbatim. Others are generic which is to say, I combined certain types of questions that were frequently asked into one and extracted the essence from different answers to form one generic answer. Sometimes, in the process of writing, an entirely new answer came that was more profound or insightful than anything I had ever uttered. Some additional questions were asked by the editor so as to provide further clarification of certain points. You will find that from the first page to the last, the dialogues continuously alternate between two different levels. On one level, I draw your attention to what is false in you, 
I speak of the nature of human unconsciousness and dysfunction, as well as its most common behavioral manifestations, from conflict in relationships to warfare between tribes or nations. Such knowledge is vital, for unless you learn to recognize the false as false, as not you, there can be no lasting transformation and you would always end up being drawn back into illusion and into some form of pain. On this level, I also show you how not to make that which is false in you into a self and into a personal problem, for that is how the false perpetuates itself. On another level, I speak of a profound transformation of human consciousness, not as a distant future possibility, but available now, no matter who or where you are. You are shown how to free yourself from enslavement to the mind, enter into this enlightened state of consciousness and sustain it in everyday life. On this level of the book, the words are not always concerned with information, but often designed to draw you into this new consciousness as you read. Again and again, I endeavor to take you with me into that timeless state of intense conscious pressure in the now, so as to give you a taste of enlightenment. Until you are able to experience what I speak of, you may find those passages somewhat repetitive. As soon as you do, however, I believe you will realize that they contain a great deal of spiritual power, and they may become for you the most rewarding parts of the book. Moreover. Since every person carries the seed of enlightenment within, I often address myself to the knower in you who dwells behind the thinker. The deeper self that immediately recognizes spiritual truth resonates it and gains strength from it. The pause symbol after certain passages is the suggestion that you may want to stop reading for a moment, become still, and feel and experience the truth of what has just been said. There may be other places in the text where you will do this naturally and spontaneously. As you begin reading this book, the meaning of certain words such as being or presence may not be entirely clear to you at first. Just read on. Questions or objections may occasionally come into your mind as you read. They will be probably answered later in the book, or they may turn out to be irrelevant as you go more deeply into the teaching and into yourself. Don't read with the mind only. Watch out for any feeling response as you read and a sense of recognition from deep within. I cannot tell you any spiritual truth that deep within you, you don't already know. All I can do is remind you of what you have forgotten. Living knowledge, ancient and yet ever new, is then activated and released from within every cell of your body. The mind always wants to categorize and compare, but this book will work better for you if you do not attempt to compare its terminology with that of other teachings. Otherwise, you will probably become confused. I use words such as mind, happiness, and consciousness in ways that do not necessarily correlate with other teachings. Don't get attached to any words. They are only stepping stones to be left behind as quickly as possible. When I occasionally quote the words of Jesus or the Buddha from A Course in Miracles or from other teachings, I do so not in order to compare, but to draw your attention to the fact that in essence, there is and always has been only one spiritual teaching, although it comes in many forms. Some of these forms, such as the ancient religions, have become so overlaid with extraneous matter that their spiritual essence has become almost completely obscured by it. To a large extent, therefore, their deep meaning is no longer recognized and their transformative power lost. When I quote from the ancient religions or other teachings, it is to reveal their deeper meaning and thereby restore their transformative power particularly for those readers who are followers of those religions or teachings. I say to them, there is no need to go elsewhere for the truth. Let me show you how to go more deeply into what you already have. Mostly, however, I have endeavored to use terminology that is as neutral as possible in order to reach a wide range of people. 
This book can be seen as a restatement for our time of that one timeless spiritual teaching, the essence of all religions. It is not derived from external resources, but from the one true source within, so it contains no theory or speculation. I speak from inner experience, and if at times I speak forcefully, it is to cut through heavy layers of mental resistance and to reach that place within you where you already know just as I know, and where the truth is recognized when it is heard. There is then a feeling of exaltation and heightened aliveness, as something within you says, yes, I know this is true. Chapter 1. You are not your mind. The greatest obstacle to enlightenment. Enlightenment? What is that? A beggar had been sitting by the side of a road for over thirty years. One day a stranger walked by. Spare some change, mumbled the beggar, mechanically holding out his old baseball cap. I have nothing to give to you, said the stranger. Then he asked, What's that you are sitting on? Nothing, replied the beggar, just an old box. I have been sitting on it for as long as I can remember. Ever looked inside asked the stranger. No, said the beggar. What's the point? There's nothing in there. Have a look inside, insisted the stranger. The beggar managed to pry open the lid. With astonishment, disbelief, and elation, he saw that the box was filled with gold. I am that stranger who has nothing to give you and who is telling you to look inside. Not inside any box, as in the parable but somewhere even closer, inside yourself. But I am not a beggar, I can hear you say. Those who have not found their true wealth, which is the radiant joy of being and the deep, unshakable peace that comes with it, are beggars, even if they have great material wealth. They are looking outside for scraps of pleasure or fulfillment for validation, security, or love, while they have a treasure within that not only includes all those things, but is infinitely greater than anything the world can offer. The word enlightenment conjures up the idea of some superhuman accomplishment, and the ego likes to keep it that way, but it is simply your natural state of felt oneness with being. It is a state of connectedness with something immeasurable and indestructible, something that, almost paradoxically, is essentially you, and yet is much greater than you. It is finding your true nature beyond name and form. The inability to feel this connectedness gives rise to the illusion of separation from yourself and from the world around you. You then perceive yourself, consciously or unconsciously, as an isolated fragment, fear arises and conflict within and without becomes the norm. I love the Buddha's simple definition of enlightenment as the end of suffering. There is nothing superhuman in that, is there? Of course, as a definition, it is incomplete. It only tells you what enlightenment is not, no suffering. But what's left when there is no more suffering? The Buddha is silent on that, and his silence implies that you'll have to find out for yourself. He uses a negative definition so that the mind cannot make it into something to believe in or into a superhuman accomplishment, a goal that is impossible for you to attain. Despite this precaution, the majority of Buddhists still believe that enlightenment is for the Buddha, not for them, at least not in this lifetime. You used the word being. Can you explain what you mean by that? Being is the eternal, ever-present one life beyond the myriad forms of life that are subject to birth and death. However, being is not only beyond, but also deep within every form as its innermost invisible and indestructible essence. This means that it is accessible to you now as your own deepest self your true nature. But don't seek to grasp it with your mind. 
don't try to understand it. You can know it only when the mind is still. When you are present, when your attention is fully and intensely in the now, being can be felt, but it can never be understood mentally. To regain awareness of being and to abide in that state of feeling realization is enlightenment. When you say being, are you talking about God? If you are, then why don't you say it? The word God has become empty of meaning through thousands of years of misuse. I use it sometimes, but I do so sparingly. By misuse, I mean that people who have never even glimpsed the realm of the sacred, the infinite vastness behind that word, use it with great conviction as if they knew what they were talking about, or they argue against it as if they knew what it is they are denying. This misuse gives rise to absurd beliefs, assertions, and egoic delusions, such as my or our God is the only true God and your God is false, or Nietzsche's famous statement, God is dead. The word God has become a closed concept. The moment the word is uttered, a mental image is created, no longer, perhaps, of an old man with a white beard, but still a mental representation of someone or something outside you, and yes, almost inevitably a male someone or something. Neither God nor being nor any other word can define or explain the ineffable reality behind the word. So the only important question is whether the word is a help or a hindrance in enabling you to experience that toward which it points. Does it point beyond itself to that transcendental reality, or does it lend itself too easily to becoming no more than an idea in your head that you believe in, a mental idol? The word being explains nothing, but nor does God. Being, however, has the advantage that is an open concept it does not reduce the infinite invisible to a finite entity. It is impossible to form a mental image of it. Nobody can claim exclusive possession of being. It is your very essence, and it is immediately accessible to you as the feeling of your own presence, the realization I am that is prior to I am this or I am that. So it is only a small step from the word being to the experience of being. What is the greatest obstacle to experience this reality? Identification with your mind, which causes thoughts to become compulsive. Not to be able to stop thinking is a dreadful affliction, but we don't realize this because almost everyone is suffering from it, so it is considered normal. This incessant mental noise prevents you from finding the realm of inner stillness that is inseparable from being. It also creates a false mind-made self that casts a shadow of fear and suffering. We will look at all that in more detail later. The philosopher Descartes believed that he had found the most fundamental truth when he made his famous statement, I think, therefore I am. He had, in fact, given expression to the most basic error, to equate thinking with being and identity with thinking. The compulsive thinker, which means almost everyone, lives in a state of apparent separateness, in an insanely complex world of continuous problems and conflict, a world that reflects the ever-increasing fragmentation of the mind. Enlightenment is a state of wholeness, of being at one and therefore at peace. At one with your life and its manifested aspect, the world, as well as with your deepest self and life unmanifested, at one with being. Enlightenment is not only the end of suffering and of continuous conflict within and without, but also the end of the dreadful enslavement to incessant thinking. What an incredible liberation this is. Identification with your mind creates an opaque screen of concepts, labels, images, words, judgments, and definitions 
that blocks all true relationship. It comes between you and yourself, between you and your fellow man and woman, between you and nature, between you and God. It is the screen of thought that creates the illusion of separateness, the illusion that there is you and a totally separate other. You then forget the essential fact that underneath the level of physical appearances and separate forms, you are one with all that is. By forget, I mean that you can no longer feel this oneness as self-evident reality. You may believe it to be true, but you no longer know it to be true. A belief may be comforting, although your own experience, however, does it become liberating. Thinking has become a disease. Disease happens when things get out of balance. For example, there is nothing wrong with cells dividing and multiplying in the body, but when this process continues in disregard of the total organism, cells proliferate and we have disease. The mind is a superb instrument if used rightly. Used wrongly, however, it becomes very destructive. To put it more accurately, it is not so much that you use your mind wrongly, you usually don't use it at all. It uses you. This is the disease. You believe that you are your mind. This is the delusion. The instrument has taken you over. I don't quite agree. It is true that I do a lot of aimless thinking like most people, but I can still choose to use my mind to get and accomplish things, and I do that all the time. Just because you can solve a crossword puzzle or build an atom bomb doesn't mean that you use your mind. Just as dogs love to chew bones, the mind loves to get its teeth into problems. That's why it does crossword puzzles and builds atom bombs. You have no interest in either. Let me ask you this. Can you be free of your mind whenever you want to? Have you found the off button? You mean stop thinking altogether? No, I can't except maybe for a moment or two. Then the mind is using you. You are unconsciously identified with it, so you don't even know that you are its slave. It's almost as if you were possessed without knowing it, and so you take the possessing entity to be yourself. The beginning of freedom is the realization that you are not the possessing entity, the thinker. Knowing this enables you to observe the entity. The moment you start watching the thinker, a higher level of consciousness becomes activated. You then begin to realize that there is a vast realm of intelligence beyond thought, and that thought is only a tiny aspect of that intelligence. You also realize that all the things that truly matter, beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace, arise from beyond the mind. You begin to awaken. Freeing yourself from your mind. What exactly do you mean by watching the thinker? When someone goes to the doctor and says, I hear a voice in my head, he or she will most likely be sent to a psychiatrist. The fact is that, in every similar way, virtually everyone hears a voice or several voices in their head all the time. The involuntary thought processes that you don't realize you have the power to stop. Continuous monologues or dialogues. You have probably come across mad people in the street, incessantly talking or muttering to themselves. Well, that's not much different from what you and all other normal people do, except that you don't do it out loud. The voice comments, speculates, judges, compares, complains, likes, dislikes, and so on. The voice isn't necessarily relevant to the situation you find yourself in at the time. It may be reviving the recent or distant past, or rehearsing or imagining possible future situations. Here it often imagines things going wrong and negative outcomes. This is called worry. Sometimes this soundtrack is accompanied by visual images or mental movies. Even if the voice is relevant to the situation at hand, 
it will interpret it in terms of the past. This is because the voice belongs to your conditioned mind, which is the result of all your past history, as well as the collective cultural mindset you inherited. So you see and judge the present through the eyes of the past and get a totally distorted view of it. It is not uncommon for the voice to be a person's own worst enemy. Many people live with a tormentor in their head that continuously attacks and punishes them and drains them of vital energy. It is the cause of untold misery and unhappiness, as well as of disease. The good news is that you can free yourself from your mind. This is the only true liberation. You can take the first step right now. Start listening to the voice in your head as often as you can. Pay particular attention to any repetitive thought patterns, those old gramophone records that have been playing in your head perhaps for many years. This is what I mean by watching the thinker, which is another way of saying, listen to the voice in your head. Be there as a witnessing presence. When you listen to that voice, listen to it impartially. That is to say, do not judge. Do not judge or condemn what you hear, for doing so would mean that the same voice has come in again through the back door. You'll soon realize there is the voice, and here I am listening to it, watching it. This I am realization, this sense of your own presence is not a thought. It arises from beyond the mind. So when you listen to a thought, you are aware not only of the thought, but also of yourself as the witness of the thought. A new dimension of consciousness has come in. As you listen to the thought, you feel a conscious presence, your deeper self, behind or underneath the thought, as it were. The thought then loses its power over you and quickly subsides because you are no longer energizing the mind through identification with it. This is the beginning of the end of involuntary and compulsive thinking. When a thought subsides, you experience a discontinuity in the mental stream, a gap of no mind. At first, the gaps will be short. A few seconds, perhaps, but gradually they will become longer. When these gaps occur, you feel a certain stillness and peace within you. This is the beginning of your natural state of felt oneness with being, which is usually obscured by the mind. With practice, the sense of stillness and peace will deepen. In fact, there is no end to its depth. You will also feel a subtle emanation of joy arising from deep within, the joy of being. It is not a trance-like state, not at all. There is no loss of consciousness here. The opposite is the case. If the price of peace were a lowering of your consciousness, and the price of stillness a lack of vitality and alertness, then they would not be worth having. In this state of interconnectedness, you are much more alert, more awake than in the mind-identified state. You are fully present. It also raises the vibrational frequency of the energy field that gives life to the physical body. As you go more deeply into this realm of no mind, as it is sometimes called in the East, you realize the state of pure consciousness. In that state, you feel your own presence with such intensity and such joy that all thinking, all emotions, your physical body, as well as the whole external world become relatively insignificant in comparison to it. And yet this is not a selfish, but a selfless state. It takes you beyond what you previously thought of as yourself. That presence is essentially you and at the same time inconceivably greater than you. What I'm trying to convey here may sound paradoxical or even contradictory, 
but there is no other way that I can express it. Instead of watching the thinker, you can also create a gap in the mind stream simply by directing the focus of your attention into the now. Just become intensely conscious of the present moment. This is a deeply satisfying thing to do. In this way, you draw consciousness away from the mind activity and create a gap of no mind in which you are highly alert and aware, but not thinking. This is the essence of meditation. In your everyday life, you can practice this by taking any routine activity that normally is only a means to an end and giving it your fullest attention so that it becomes an end in itself. For example, every time you walk up and down the stairs in your house or place of work, pay close attention to every step, every movement, even your breathing. Be totally present. Or when you wash your hands, pay attention to all the sense perceptions associated with the activity, the sound and feel of the water, the movement of your hands, the scent of the soap, and so on. Or when you get into your car, after you close the door, pause for a few seconds and observe the flow of your breath. Become aware of a silent but powerful sense of presence. There is one certain criterion by which you can measure your success in this practice, the degree of peace that you feel within. So the single most vital step in your journey towards enlightenment is this. Learn to disidentify from your mind. Every time you create a gap in the stream of mind, the light of your consciousness grows stronger. One day, you may catch yourself smiling at the voice in your head, as you would smile at the antics of a child. This means that you no longer take the content of your mind all that seriously, as your sense of self does not depend on it. Enlightenment, rising above thought. Isn't thinking essential in order to survive in this world? Your mind is an instrument, a tool. It is there to be used for a specific task, and when the task is completed, you lay it down. As it is, I would say about 80 or 90% of most people's thinking is not only repetitive and useless, but because of its dysfunctional and often negative nature, much of it is also harmful. Observe your mind, and you will find this to be true. It causes a serious leakage of vital energy. This kind of compulsive thinking is actually an addiction. What characterizes an addiction? Quite simply this. You no longer feel that you have the choice to stop. It seems stronger than you. It also gives you a false sense of pleasure. Pleasure that invariably turns into pain. Why should we be addicted to thinking? Because you are identified with it, which means that you derive your sense of self from the content and activity of your mind. Because you believe that you would cease to be if you stopped thinking. As you grow up, you form a mental image of who you are based on your personal and cultural conditioning. We may call this phantom self the ego. It consists of mind activity and can only be kept going through constant thinking. The term ego means different things to different people. But when I use it here, it means a false self created by unconscious identification with the mind. To the ego, the present moment hardly exists. Only past and future are considered important. This total reversal of the truth accounts for the fact that in the ego mode, the mind is so dysfunctional. It is always concerned with keeping the past alive, because without it, who are you? It constantly projects itself into the future to ensure its continued survival and to seek some kind of release or fulfillment there. It says, one day when this, that, or the other happens, I'm going to be okay happy, at peace. 
even when the ego seems to be concerned with the present, it is not the present that it sees. It misperceives it completely because it looks at it through the eyes of the past. Or it reduces the present to a means to an end, an end that always lies in the mind-projected future. Observe your mind, and you'll see that this is how it works. The present moment holds the key to liberation, but you cannot find the present moment as long as you are your mind. I don't want to lose my ability to analyze and discriminate. I wouldn't mind learning to think more clearly, in a more focused way, but I don't want to lose my mind. The gift of thought is the most precious thing we have. Without it, we would just be another species of animal. The predominance of mind is no more than a stage in the evolution of consciousness. We need to go on to the next stage now as a matter of urgency. Otherwise, we will be destroyed by the mind which has grown into a monster. I will talk about this in more detail later. Thinking and consciousness are not synonymous. Thinking is only a small aspect of consciousness. Thought cannot exist without consciousness, but consciousness does not need thought. Enlightenment means rising above thought, not falling back to a level below thought, the level of an animal or a plant. In the enlightened state, you still use your thinking mind when needed, but in a much more focused and effective way than before. You use it mostly for practical purposes, but you are free of the involuntary internal dialogue, and there is inner stillness. When you do use your mind, and particularly when a creative solution is needed, you oscillate every few minutes or so between thought and stillness, between mind and no mind. No mind is consciousness without thought. Only in that way is it possible to think creatively, because only in that way does thought have any real power. Thought alone, when it is no longer connected with the much vaster realm of consciousness, quickly becomes barren, insane, destructive. The mind is essentially a survival machine, attack and defense against other minds, gathering, storing, and analyzing information. This is what it is good at, but it is not at all creative. All true artists, whether they know it or not, create from a place of no mind, from inner stillness. The mind then gives form to the creative impulse or insight. Even the great scientists have reported that their creative breakthroughs came at a time of mental quietude. The surprising result of a nationwide inquiry among America's most eminent mathematicians, including Einstein, to find out their working methods was that thinking plays only a subordinate part in the brief, decisive phase of the creative act itself. So I would say that the simple reason why the majority of scientists are not creative is not because they don't know how to think, but because they don't know how to stop thinking. It wasn't through the mind, through thinking, that the miracle that is life on earth or your body was created and is being sustained. There is clearly an intelligence at work that is far greater than the mind. How can a single human cell measuring one one thousandth of an inch in diameter contain instructions within its DNA that would fill one thousand books of six hundred pages each? The more we learn about the workings of the body, the more we realize just how vast is the intelligence at work within it and how little we know. When the mind reconnects with that, it becomes a most wonderful tool. It then serves something greater than itself. Emotion, the body's reaction to your mind. What about emotions? I get caught up in my emotions more than I do in my mind. Mind, in the way I use the word, is not just thought. It includes your emotions as well as all unconscious mental emotional reactive patterns. Emotion arises at the place where mind and body meet. It is the body's reaction to your mind, or you might say, a reflection of your mind in the body. For example, 
An attack thought or a hostile thought will create a buildup of energy in the body that we call anger. The body is getting ready to fight. The thought that you are being threatened physically or psychologically causes the body to contract. And this is the physical side of what we call fear. Research has shown that strong emotions even cause changes in the biochemistry of the body. These biochemical changes represent the physical or material aspect of the emotion. Of course, you are not usually conscious of all your thought patterns, and it is often only through watching your emotions that you can bring them into awareness. The more you are identified with your thinking, your likes and dislikes, judgments and interpretations, which is to say, the less present you are as the watching consciousness, the stronger the emotional energy charge will be, whether you are aware of it or not. If you cannot feel your emotions, if you are cut off from them, you will eventually experience them on a purely physical level, as a physical problem or symptom. A great deal has been written about this in recent years, so we don't need to get into it here. A strong unconscious emotional pattern may even manifest as an external event that appears to just happen to you. For example, I have observed that people who carry a lot of anger inside without being aware of it and without expressing it are more likely to be attacked verbally or even physically by other angry people and often for no apparent reason. They have a strong emanation of anger that certain people pick up subliminally and that triggers their own latent anger. If you have difficulty feeling your emotions, start by focusing attention on the inner energy field of your body. Feel the body from within. This will also put you in touch with your emotions. We will explore this in more detail later. You say that an emotion is the mind's reflection in the body, but sometimes there is a conflict between the two. The mind says no, while the emotion says yes, or the other way around. If you really want to know your mind, the body will always give you a truthful reflection. So look at the emotion, or rather, feel it in your body. If there is an apparent conflict between them, the thought will be the lie, the emotion will be the truth. Not the ultimate truth of who you are, but the relative truth of your state of mind at the time. Conflict between surface thoughts and unconscious mental processes is certainly common. You may not yet be able to bring your unconscious mind activity into awareness as thoughts, but it will always be reflected in the body as an emotion, and of this you can become aware. To watch an emotion in this way is basically the same as listening to or watching a thought, which I described earlier. The only difference is that while a thought is in your head, an emotion has a strong physical component and so is primarily felt in the body. You can then allow the emotion to be there without being controlled by it. You no longer are the emotion. You are the watcher, the observing presence. If you practice this, all that is unconscious in you will be brought into the light of consciousness. So observing our emotions is as important as observing our thoughts. Yes, make it a habit to ask yourself, what's going on inside me at this moment? That question will point you in the right direction, but don't analyze, just watch. Focus your attention within, feel the energy of the emotion. If there is no emotion present, take your attention more deeply into the inner energy field of your body. It is the doorway into being. An emotion usually represents an amplified and energized thought pattern. And because of its often overpowering energetic charge, it is not easy initially to stay present enough to be able to watch it. It wants to take you over and usually succeeds, unless there is enough presence in you. If you are pulled into unconscious identification with the emotion through lack of presence, which is normal, the emotion temporarily becomes you. 
Often a vicious circle builds up between your thinking and the emotion. They feed each other. The thought pattern creates a magnified reflection of itself in the form of an emotion, and the vibrational frequency of the emotion keeps feeding the original thought pattern. By dwelling mentally on the situation, event, or person that is the perceived cause of the emotion, the thought feeds energy to the emotion, which in turn energizes the thought pattern, and so on. Basically, all emotions are modifications of one primordial undifferentiated emotion that has its origin in the loss of awareness of who you are beyond name and form. Because of its undifferentiated nature, it is hard to find a name that precisely describes the emotion. Fear comes close, but apart from a continuous sense of threat, it also includes a deep sense of abandonment and incompleteness. It may be best to use a term that is as undifferentiated as that basic emotion and simply call it pain. One of the main tasks of the mind is to fight or remove that emotional pain, which is one of the reasons for its incessant activity, but all it can ever achieve is to cover it up temporarily. In fact, the harder the mind struggles to get rid of the pain, the greater the pain. The mind can never find the solution, nor can it afford to allow you to find the solution, because it is itself an intrinsic part of the problem. Imagine the chief of police trying to find an arsonist when the arsonist is the chief of police. You will not be free of that pain until you cease to derive your sense of self from identification with the mind, which is to say, from ego. The mind is then toppled from its place of power, and being reveals itself as your true nature. Yes, I know what you are going to ask. I was going to ask, what about positive emotions such as love and joy? They are inseparable from your natural state of interconnectedness with being. Glimpses of love and joy or brief moments of deep peace are possible whenever a gap occurs in the stream of thought. For most people, such gaps happen rarely and only accidentally, in moments when the mind is rendered speechless, sometimes triggered by great beauty, extreme physical exertion, or even great danger. Suddenly, there is inner stillness, and within that stillness, there is a subtle but intense joy. There is love. There is peace. Usually, such moments are short-lived, as the mind quickly resumes its noise-making activity that we call thinking. Love, joy, and peace cannot flourish until you have freed yourself from mind dominance. But they are not what I would call emotion. They lie beyond the emotions on a much deeper level, so you need to become fully conscious of your emotions and be able to feel them before you can feel that which lies beyond them. Emotion literally means disturbance. The word comes from the Latin emover, meaning to disturb. Love, joy, and peace are deep states of being, or rather three aspects of the state of interconnectedness with being. As such, they have no opposite. This is because they arise from beyond the mind. Emotions, on the other hand, being part of the dualistic mind, are subject to the law of opposites. This simply means that you cannot have good without bad. So in the unenlightened, mind-identified condition, what is sometimes wrongly called joy is the usually short-lived pleasure side of the continuously alternating pain-slash-pleasure cycle. Pleasure is always derived from something outside you, whereas joy arises from within. The very thing that gives you pleasure today will give you pain tomorrow, or it will leave you, so its absence will give you pain. And what is often referred to as love may be pleasurable and exciting for a while, but it is an addictive clinging, an extremely needy condition that can turn into its opposite at the flick of a switch. Many love relationships, after the initial euphoria has passed, actually oscillate between love and hate, attraction, and attack. Real love 
doesn't make you suffer. How could it? It doesn't suddenly turn into hate, nor does real joy turn into pain. As I said, even before you are enlightened, before you have freed yourself from your mind, you may get glimpses of true joy, true love, or of a deep inner peace, still but vibrantly alive. These are aspects of your true nature, which is usually obscured by the mind. Even within a normal addictive relationship, there can be moments when the presence of something more genuine, something incorruptible, can be felt. But they will only be glimpses, soon to be covered up again through mind interference. It may then seem that you had something very precious and lost it, or your mind may convince you that it was all an illusion anyway. The truth is that it wasn't an illusion, and you cannot lose it. It is part of your natural state, which can be obscured but can never be destroyed by the mind. Even when the sky is heavily overcast, the sun hasn't disappeared. It's still there on the other side of the clouds. The Buddha says that pain or suffering arises through desire or craving, and that to be free of pain, we need to cut the bonds of desire. All cravings are the mind seeking salvation or fulfillment in external things and in the future as a substitute for the joy of being. As long as I am my mind, I am those cravings, those needs, wants, attachments, and aversions. And apart from them, there is no I except a mere possibility as unfulfilled potential, a seed that has not yet sprouted. In that state, even my desire to become free or enlightened is just another craving for fulfillment or completion in the future. So don't seek to become free or desire to achieve enlightenment. Become present. Be there as the observer of the mind. Instead of quoting the Buddha, be the Buddha. Be the awakened one, which is what the word Buddha means. Humans have been in the grip of pain for eons, ever since they fell from the state of grace, entered the realm of time and mind, and lost awareness of being. At that point, they started to perceive themselves as meaningless fragments in an alien universe, unconnected to the source and to each other. Pain is inevitable as long as you are identified with your mind, which is to say as long as you are unconscious, spiritually speaking. I am talking here primarily of emotional pain, which is also the main cause of physical pain and physical disease. Resentment, hatred, self-pity, guilt, anger, depression, jealousy, and so on. Even the slightest irritation are all forms of pain. And every pleasure or emotional high constrains within itself the seed of pain, its inseparable opposite which will manifest in time. Anybody who has ever taken drugs to get high will know that the high eventually turns into a low, that the pleasure turns into some sort of pain. Many people also know from their own experience how easily and quickly an intimate relationship can turn from a source of pleasure to a source of pain. Seen from a higher perspective, both the negative and the positive polarities are faces of the same coin, are both part of the underlying pain that is inseparable from the mind-identified egoic state of consciousness. There are two levels to your pain, the pain that you create now and the pain from the past that still lives on in your mind and body. Ceasing to create pain in the present and dissolving past pain that is what I want to talk about now.